esteemed speaker is Jeff Adachi. He is the only elected uh, public defender in the state of California. He has run three times for this position, but twice unopposed because he's so fabulous or for another reason that I don't know. Nobody wants a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's, when he was actually, uh, you were chief public, chief public defender, yeah. You, you had over 100 jury trials, 3,000 3, cases. You run an office of 100 attorneys and um, 60 staff members. Their budget is $24 million annually. He also ran for mayor of San Francisco in 2011, and he came sixth, but he only joined the race three months before the election, right? Yeah. Am I getting it wrong? Don't, don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to being the San Francisco public defender, he is also a filmmaker. He's made three films, and two of them are here. One, the slanted screen racial facial, which is his most recent, and uh, you don't know Jack about Jack Sue. If anybody remembers Barney Miller, he was the, um, what was his character's name on that show? I don't remember. Yeah, Sergeant Yemena. Yeah, okay. So he's a filmmaker as well, and he will be speaking at City Arts and Lectures in December on um, post-Obama racial equality. That's the topic. But before he speaks at City Arts and Lectures, he's here at Fireside Chat. So please join me in welcoming Jeff Adachi to Fireside Chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming, Jeff. <laughs> it's great to be here. Oh, a beautiful house. Thank you. Thank you. I'm never going to leave. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I talked to a lot of people prior to today. And it turns out that a lot of people think they, they might have a vague idea of what a public defender mm. does, but nobody really has a concrete idea. So would you mind just jumping in and telling us? Well, why? unless you've been accused of a crime or served on jury duty, neither of which is particularly popular, uh, you probably wouldn't know yeah. what a public defender uh, is. But we provide legal representation to folks who can't afford a lawyer. And every year in San Francisco, there are about 20,000 people who are accused of a crime. It doesn't mean that you have to live in San Francisco. It just means that you have to be in San Francisco when you're accused of a crime. And if you can't afford a lawyer, then we are appointed to uh, represent you. So we are the lawyers of last resort. And we are lawyers. Often people don't think public defenders are, are real lawyers. Sometimes when we win a case, so, client will say, oh, you know, you'll be a lawyer one day. You know? <laughs> so, well, I, I'm a lawyer. I've been a lawyer for 30 years. But um, the truth of the matter is, is that public defenders are often uh, some of the uh, most talented uh, attorneys because you have to be dedicated to do the work uh, that we do. We have uh, uh, lawyers who went to Harvard and Yale, some of the best schools, and they want to do uh, this work. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that begs the question, why did you want to do this work? Why not become, you know, in, work in the private sector, yeah. do corporate law? Well, I, I was probably one of the least likely to succeed in, in high school. I think that was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was my moniker. And, you know, I, I, I didn't even plan to go to, uh, to college. Really? Uh, most of my friends, you know, had jobs in, in, in high school and, you know, we just wanted to work and make money. And it wasn't until uh, I became involved uh, in a case uh, when I was in college. And this is after I you know, decided I was going to go to college and, and uh, I had terrible grades. So study hard. <laughs> <laughs> I had terrible grades. And uh, it wasn't until I was, I think, a senior in high school that I decided I wanted to go to college. They had a, a college day. And back when I went to high school in the 70s, uh, you know, they had a vocational tracking program. So if you didn't qualify for what they considered college material, then they tracked you for a vocational. And I remember my, my, uh, my college, I mean, my uh, high school counselor asked me, what does your dad do? And I said, my dad's an auto mechanic. He goes, you got to be an auto mechanic. So I said, okay. And at that moment, I just decided, you know what? I'm going to try to defy that. And I want to go to college. And so I had terrible grades, and I ended up going to City College for a year working my GPA up, yeah. and then I uh, got into Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And my goal at that point was just to try to make <laughs> That's it. quite a switch. Well, no, it was a lot easier then. <laughs> All you need is a, is a B average. And, and, and uh, uh, I wanted to make a lot of money, so I, I got into the business school 
at, huh. at Berkeley. And then I had an epiphany of sorts. I got involved in a case of a San Francisco man who was on death row for a crime he didn't commit. And uh, my roommate and I had read about the case, and uh, we uh, talked to the reporter who wrote the story and became convinced that he was innocent. So we joined the defense committee. And we weren't lawyers, we were just, you know, students. And we got involved in trying to advocate for his freedom, which is, you know, talking to people about his case, trying to raise money uh, for his defense. And uh, I, I, I got involved in a five-year, you know, saga, which, you know, took us on campuses and churches all over the Bay Area. And we ultimately uh, were able to hi hire an attorney for him. The case was overturned, and they decided to retry him in San Francisco nine years after he had been convicted. And so I got to see this whole trial, you know, uh, before, you know, before my own eyes. Uh, and uh, uh, I was in court when he was found not guilty. It was, it was a case of a of a Korean immigrant who had been uh, misidentified uh, as being a, a Chinese gang uh, member. And, um, you know, he was accused of murder, convicted, and was on death row. And so being involved in a case like that just completely opened my eyes to, you know, so many of the injustices that were occurring. And then that on top of the fact that, you know, I'm Japanese-American, and so my parents and grandparents, you know, were interned during, in, during World War II with 120,000 other Japanese Americans. And I, I'm ashamed to say, I, you know, I didn't learn about that until I was maybe 13 years old because we didn't talk about it. And I remember I got into a fight with another kid at school uh, because he said, oh, you know, your, your parents were in jail. And I was like, no, they weren't. And I got in trouble and I had to explain to my parents what happened. And, uh, you know, I asked him, I said, well, were you in, in jail? And he said, yeah, we were in the internment camps. I said, well, for how long? For four years. I go, well, what did you do? What? And they were like, well, you know, we're Japanese Americans. And, and uh, you know, they, they decided that they were going to put all Japanese Americans behind bars. So I think that had a lot to do with my wanting to be a public defender, too. Because it taught me, you know, that justice was something that had to be fought for. Yeah. You went to law school. You decided to become a public defender. Can you explain to us, jumping forward many, many years now, why your office is an elected office when there's no other elected public defender in the state of California? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an odd you know, thing that, that you would have an elected public defender, most people think. But if you think about it, every district attorney, and that's the prosecutor who brings charges, who has the power to bring charge, charges against somebody and put them in, in jail or prison or sentence them to death, um, is elected. Whereas the public defender in most places, except for Florida and Alaska for some reason, and San Francisco, are appointed. And when you're appointed, you serve at the pleasure of the hiring authority, whether it's the mayor or the board of supervisors. And in San Francisco, I'd like to say it's because you know it was rooted in justice and liberty and all that, but actually like a lot of things in San Francisco in the 1900s, it was rooted in corruption. The, uh, person who was going to run for uh, district attorney, um, the sitting district attorney didn't want that person to run against him. And so instead, when the public defender's office, you know, came into being, it's, it's a really interesting history. I can't go into it in a lot of detail because I don't have time, but the public defender office uh, has been around, our office has been around since 1921. And it's because the first woman attorney in California, her name was Clara Fultz, in the 1870s, she was a, a single mother, uh, divorced, had four children, decided she was going to become a lawyer. Back then, you could not become a lawyer if you were a woman. This, the, the rules said that you could not become uh, a lawyer. You had to be a white male. So she changed that to say that um, a person could become a lawyer. So that not only made it possible for women to become lawyers, but also racial minorities. And then uh, she became a, a criminal defense attorney. She was the first lawyer ever sworn in California. And after practicing for a number of years, she became, a, you know, and think about it, at the time, women couldn't serve on juries. They couldn't okay. be judges. Um, she was all alone, but she would routinely beat her male opponents who would say terrible things about her. Like they would say, she's emotional, she's a woman, you can't believe her. And of course, she would beat them routinely in court. So she came up with the idea of a public defender's uh, office and she, uh, delivered a, a speech at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. 
And this is the thing. She spent 21 years advocating to have a public defender's office. And it was only after the woman's right to vote passed the year before that she was successful. So anyways, fast forward to 1921. This person, his name was Frank Egan, was going to run for DA. And they didn't want him to be the DA. So they gave him the public defender uh, position. So he served very well uh, for about 20 years until he himself was convicted of murder in one of the most <laughs> celebrated uh, uh, trial. And I was talking to Lauren because Lauren's father used to work at, at the public defender. We just met uh, at, the, at the salon, but her father worked at the public defender's office in the 60s. Oh, cool. And, and, and when she was growing up. Um, but uh, yeah, for a while, that's what our office was known for, is that the head public defender was convicted of murder. And uh, he was sent to San Quentin and eventually was released. But after that, I mean, our office was probably known as one of the, the worst offices because public defender offices traditionally were, 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 were treated like the stepchild of the criminal justice system. There's no money. You often hear these stories now of public defender offices that are overburdened. I, I talked, I met recently one of the public defenders in, in uh, South Carolina, and mm -hmm. she told me she had 450 felony cases that she was handling at any given time. You think about that. Everyone in this room, and you multiply it by nine, and, and to be responsible for that many people, and it's impossible to, to, to prepare the case. But, um, you know, our office, I think, uh, today is, is, I think, one of the best. I mean, our, our budget now, I think that was an old uh, bio I had sent you, but our budget now is, when I came into office, it was $13 million. Today, it's $31 million. Okay. And, and that might, you know, be shocking if you're a taxpayer. Like, why are you spending so much money? But, you know, we, we, we have a big responsibility. We have to represent uh, people each and every day, whether you're, represent, you're charged with murder and you're facing life in prison or you're facing a year in the county jail. I mean, that's huge. It's, it's a huge impact that a criminal case can have on your life. And then you might think, well, everybody's guilty, right? Most people are guilty. No. I mean, actually about a third of the cases that we handle end up getting dismissed. About a third of the cases, uh, you know, result in some kind of treatment or, or program. And a third of the cases, uh, some of those cases are, are resulting guilty pleas and m other cases go to trial. And so if you're innocent I and mean, you're charged with a crime, just like the gentleman was that we worked on his case, and you don't have a good lawyer, um, and, and the only resort you have is a public defender, uh, you better hope that there's somebody in there that cares about you and that knows what they're doing. So that begs the question, how do people in the public defender's office not experience burnout? It must be an incredibly emotionally draining, difficult um, job. 